Hi, Humanic viewers. My name is Tim Campbell. I'm board advisor to the company. And once again, we've got a fantastic interview for you. Today, we're joined by the amazing Duena Blomstrom, who's going to talk to us all about the power of emotional banking. Welcome, Duena. Thank you so much for coming along. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm doing great today. Thank fantastic. you. Fantastic. So, Everybody's probably going to do some research now and the first thing that comes up is how many different jobs that you do. You have been involved in so many different roles, I can't believe it. So talk to us about some of your career history to date. Oh God, we'll be here for a few hours. Um, <laughs> I'll try and keep it as short as possible. I'm, I'm not very good with uh, keeping things short, but I'll, I'll attempt. Um, I've, I have a background in psychology, and which was complemented or eradicated by a background in business, depending <laughs> on, on how you want to look at it. And um, I realized um, early on that I wanted to do something at the um, intersection of where businesses grow and, and kind of work with humans as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, which in, in the early, early days of uh, software meant um, CRM, meant uh, data analysis very rudimentary back in the 90s. And um, it, it very quickly uh, and maybe sadly brought me to sales and business development, which was interesting for a while. I, um, I started and sold a um, company when I was really young which was a really great experience um, and also taught me a lot about being an entrepreneur. Didn't teach me a lot about it being difficult, which is maybe something I should have learned earlier. And then um, as my career developed and I moved countries um, a lot, I ended up in Sweden at, at, the, at the right time, at the right place maybe, just at the beginning of this fintech wave. And uh, I became employee five of a company called Meniga, which uh, ended up doing incredibly well after all, if I say so myself. Mm -hmm. um, and when I left them about uh, two years and a half ago or so, um, they, they were now from, from you know, a very incumbent PFM solution, they were now, um, they had won at the PFM game and they, they had sold to uh, 28 banks um, in all geographies, um, grown to 160 people. And it was, and he's still doing amazingly well in that mm -hmm. space, which meant that um, I was really lucky and found the industry at the time when it was growing. I ended up um, being part of the digital strategy of maybe, gosh, 200, 300 banks, wow. many, 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 at the, at the time where they were just figuring out what they need to be doing. So you were well um, in demand? Uh, yes, it was a very uh, key product for what they were doing. Uh, so PFM stands for Personal Financial Management for those, uh, for your viewers who don't know, meaning that it's a type of product that will be very, both very close to the consumer and very central to any type of, uh, of digital strategy that a bank might have, whether a small bank or a big bank, everyone mm. needed this mm. product, which again meant that I was very lucky and got into the fintech conversation really early on. This is what, seven, eight years ago now. Mm. Um, it, it also meant that outside of meeting all these bankers, I met the um, captains of the industry at the time, all your, your biggest names um, that are today in what we call jokingly, but apparently officially now, the FinTech Mafia. <laughs> and, it's, um, and they became very close friends. We mm. feel like we built things together. Now, what happened next was a bit uh, strange of a trajectory. I was, yes, already a mentor and uh, an investor and an advisor in various positions in, mm -hmm. in the sphere. But uh, somewhere along this journey, I became really interested in a concept that I came up with called emotional banking. Mm -hmm. And the concept was, or, or my, my shock was, that despite the fact that we were doing all these things in digital, we weren't spending any time figuring out how consumers feel about their money which uh, I found appalling and, and um, I, I believed had to be changed. Mm. So I left my position at Meniga um, to do that. I, a um, a, was that a risky thing? Well, it depends on your definition. I didn't think it was because every banker that I was talking to was really excited about it mm. and they, they believed they needed to do something with it. So I thought, um, I thought that, that would be an, an easy proposition to kind of just move it into them. And um, to be fair, it was risky in retrospect mm. because I never... I, I never approached it as a business. I approached it as something that a uh, sort of a personal crusade of something that I had to fix, um, which at the same time I was investing in other businesses. I was, uh, I started a, a fintech consultancy. Um, so I wasn't, it wasn't the only day job course, evidently. Yeah. Um, with that said, it, it became clear fast that just going into a bank and telling them why they're horrible to their consumers is not exactly useful for anybody. 
Um, so I decided to kind of make it constructive as, as fast as possible and, and look at the root as to why they're not really looking at consumers' feelings. And which brought me to the fact that banks are not really brands. Mm. They don't have the ethos of a brand mm. as, as other consumer organizations. Or don't. fans who would flock to them in the same Precisely, way. Precisely. That th that's because they're not a real brand. Mm. And uh, so, so then my next question was, why aren't they a brand? Why aren't they a lot more interested in, in being that addictive to their consumers? Yeah. And the evident answer is there's just no imperative in banking and there was no need to really focus on the consumer historically. Um, not in a very intimate way. Mm. So you could you could tell banks that they need to do human-centered design all day long, mm. but unless that imperative came from their necessity of, of building a relationship with the yeah. consumer, yeah, it doesn't hold. Yeah. So my next kind of question was, okay, so now we know they're not a brand, they know, we know they don't have imperative, what is it that they need to change so that that changes? Let's say that an imperative does come, and it has, over the last few years, the imperative became much clearer to banks, whether you know, it's the challengers, now it's in Europe, it's PSD2. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's consumer driven or it's the legislation driven, the imperatives started lining yep. up. Yep. With that said, banks now realize that maybe they should have done better by the consumer, yet had they had no real quick means of doing so. So I realized that it was an organizational issue. And so what I need to come up with were um, a couple of methods that would change banking culture which I didn't really want to go into, mm. to be honest with you, coming from a, from a very um, product-driven environment to start talking about uh, esoteric concepts such as banking culture yeah. was very uncomfortable yeah. of a move well, I know I've got to be careful. I won't talk about the future of banking. That will irk you and get on your nerves. <laughs> I read from one of your recent blog posts that you don't... No, there's a, um, you know, I, it, it, I think it's very clear these days. Yeah. Back in the day, people would be wondering where it's going and whether or not, you know, whether it's about technology or people, mm -hmm. whether it's about, or ba back in the day, I mean, all of two years ago, you'd have that kind That's of how quick it is. Yes. And then you would also have, um, is banking going to be kind of keep having a relationship with the consumer or will they have to kind of take the other route and, and accept that they will become a glorified pipe for, mm. for those that do have a relationship. Yeah. So those, I think those are, that rhetoric is now crystal clear, which it wasn't for many years. Mm. With that said, the, the question if becomes, what, what do you grasp at first? Do you grasp at technology? Um, or do you need to do something about your people and internally mm. in terms of, an, of a, the, in terms of the soul of the organization to mm. change things. And I think you have to do both. Mm -hmm. So in the position that I was in, I, I, I started working on actual physical, I realized I can't do this change one by one, one bank at a time and nobody has time for that. So I decided to um, come up with, with very functional methods on, with the conscious goal of coming up with something that works, leaving it with some consultancy that's able to implement it and then going back into technology. Okay. And so I did that. Um, I'm, I finished the book. It's it's about to be uh, hopefully released before the end of the year. What's it called? Um, it's emotion, just emotional banking. Okay. And um, in in the book, we, it's essentially there are two big methods that I've tested with banks that seem to work in terms of changing internal culture. Time will tell if they really work for long or mm -hmm. if they work in time for them to make a, a serious that, change. Yeah. But the, the methods right now are one of them is called uh, the Keep It Real program and it's helping them speak English again because they've been speaking consultancy for far too long and mm -hmm. that alone, that lack of communication makes it impossible to use technology. Yeah. Um, and then in particular you know, in a market like ours where it's so complicated, there's so many um, different types of understandings that you need to have so that you make it work, unless you really speak English, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So, so that's part of the program. And the other part of the program is called Build a Voice, and it's helping bankers, in particular at CX level, get involved in the conversation mm -hmm. and, and get passionate about fintech which means that once you accomplish that and they start having a voice and an opinion and they start entering a conversation with mm. the Brett Kings and the Jim Maruses, it starts going down uh, towards their, their organizations and yeah. you see it seeping through the organization. So those are the two methods. They're not you know, exhaustive and that's what's gonna save banking, but I thought for my part, this is kind of, I think they're both quite um, solid and yeah. fundamental. I leave them, I'm still looking for a home for them, I'm trying to decide between a couple of consultancies, and I leave them with them, mm -hmm. and then I'll go back to technology, which yeah. is why um, not long ago I accepted a position um, to, uh, to 
to help grow um, marketplace for Temenos. Mm -hmm. Temenos is a very product company, a very f one of the oldest fintech companies. Um, and where they're based? They're not really oldest. I think they're only a f uh, for well for well, for, fintech for, for fintech. Yes, yes <laughs> for fintech. Uh, they're based uh, they're based in Switzerland, but they have a very strong presence everywhere, mm -hmm. and they are running. Mm, some of the most profitable banks, they're always kind of seen as the highest of the quadrant in terms of all the other core banking vendors. Yep. Um, and they are from, you know, kind of, if you look at core banking vendors, it's not the sexiest of businesses, it's not the easiest of businesses, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's clearly not been something that, you know, you'd think is fintech. However, unless you keep that up in terms of product, it, it is the most fintech there is, number one. Number two, uh, from, from that quadrant of all the other vendors, they are probably the most fintechy and hip and trendy one. So that was one of my considerations. The other one is um, everyone is talking about building a platform mm -hmm. these days, and I believe it's the only vehicle that we're going to move fast in terms of technology. Mm -hmm. um, but I looked at the other, because you know, if you put all of the core bank vendors side by side, they're, they're very smart in terms of writing technology, evidently, and they know what the banks need. So they're all kind of working on a proposition that would help this middle layer of a platform mm -hmm. um, to enable open banking, to enable all these models. and. But I looked at the other propositions and they were nowhere near completion. So I, I went with Temenos because they have very strong technology from that perspective. And realistically, it's a race against time and we don't, we all kind of understand what needs to be done. Yeah. It's just a question of who gets there fastest. Plus, but it's really interesting because you, you highlight that communication is, is incredibly important for some of these brands or to become brands for mm -hmm. some of the banks who haven't done it particularly well. But at the same time, lots of the big four are advising lots of these organisations to automate lots of the processes, mm -hmm. to get robots to, to take away some of the admin works or the, the, the repeated tasks right. that we normally take. So, so how does that correspond with making a personal connection right. with a customer who's thinking, I need a mortgage or I want a credit card? Right. So I think it's a very interesting uh, question. Now I get to see it from, from yet back to seeing it from the banker's shoes because um, for instance some of the propositions right now I'm in charge of uh, well selling essentially all the fintech to all the banks mm -hmm. you could think of it that way so which means that um, in my position right now I, I deal with almost 50 fintech companies with hundreds of products in the marketplace so it becomes a conversation of what what do they get and there's a lot of the, a lot of the conversation is around automation mm -hmm. and of course you know if you look at anything from robot advisory to, to chatbots it's yeah. all around that yeah. and AI could kind of play a role um, in, in, in that vein. And then it becomes a more religious, do we really want human contact or, or would this be mm -hmm. replaceable? I don't think it's, I don't think this, it's the right framing for it. Okay. Um, short term, all of these propositions are going to be automating in, in the interest of cost saving and that's a hurry. But longer term, whatever these propositions are building are gonna be essentially feeding into making sure that they fit into the consumer's well-being. Mm -hmm. So in, in other words, I don't think to the consumer it's relevant if it's a robot or a human that offers the kind of thing they need. And mm -hmm. the kind of thing they need is probably not just advice, not just information. Mm -hmm. It's a connection as well. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, kind of a science fiction conversation. Can you create a connection with AI or yeah. does it have to be with flesh and blood? Yeah. So, don't, don't, don't get me scared. Uh, robots stepping into my world could be very, very intimidating. My <laughs> wife might be kicking me to the turn quite quickly. <laughs> but I suppose building on that is you're, you're quite an anomaly. Not only have you had a variety of jobs, combining psychology with business, um, building, growing and selling enterprises mm -hmm. and now being a mentor in a lot mm -hmm. of different places. The, the reality, there aren't very many women in fintech. Why, why do you think that's the case? I don't know that it's because it's fintech. I think there are many women in technology in, in general. And um, I normally stay away from conversations about uh, gender because I find that the only way that we're going to fix this is if we uh, step away from gender, colour, nationality and just uh, move towards strictly meritocracy. meritocracy yeah. I, I have a big obsession with that. I tend to not um, take up any invitations to women-only forums and so on. Um, but reality of it is you don't have many women in technology in general, mm -hmm. you don't have many women in, um, in different types of sciences that mm -hmm. are underrepresented. It's not underrepresented by society mm -hmm. choice. Yep. It's simply not necessarily, I find, something that's really um, palatable necessarily. Yep. Plus, um, you know, there's, there's so many reasons why women are not 
more um, represented in entrepreneurship and not more represented in in uh, technology mm. and in banking and all those reasons kind of go back to you know kind of how many mathematicians do we have yeah. or how many computer scientists we yeah. have i don't think that any, it's any different mm. and it in fact in fintech there might be a bigger drive than in other types of technology and you'll see all these hundreds of initiatives and that probably will will open up access but i think a more interesting conversation is do um, women get access to capital in the same fashion because I think that's a lot more interesting in, in, in fostering entrepreneurship in mm. general and not only for women but for kids yeah. um, and I think it goes back to when we have young ones at our disposal do we kind of move them towards something that's going to be courageous and yeah. entrepreneurship or yeah. not I don't think it's a gender thing I think it's just a question of mm. um, well, we don't I foster that a lot yet I, I think the, the, the reports are quite clear that women manage money particularly when they seek it from venture capital in a much better way. way sometimes they don't ask for as much as they need mm -hmm. and there's not the big bravado of right. what the returns on, on the investment are going to be right. but the success rate even from a corporate perspective, mm -hmm. when there are more diverse boards, yes, et cetera, absolutely. is evident. So I think you're right, absolutely. that business case is well trodden, et cetera. But, but we need more role models who right. are standing up at the top of companies to say, almost like the Roger Bannisters of the world, mm -hmm. it can be done. And right. do you feel there's a, there's a pressure on you to be one of those role models? I don't think there is pressure. I'm, I'm very difficult to pressure into anything. So <laughs> I, I can believe there that. Is, yes. There is. There, I haven't really felt it. I mean, you know, in a way, again, I... I sometimes get roped into women-only initiatives, but it's really reluctantly. I just mm. find it to be perpetuating yeah. the problem. Um, I, I'm hoping that one can lead by example without having to go to a, a specialized forum for it. Mm. Um, it's I, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say it was easy. Um, it, it's not. It's harder. But the fun bit is, women can do much harder stuff. So, yeah, um, I'm not <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it's not been. It's not, of course, not been easy. And I mean, you know, you're still expected, yes, to be carrying everything and, yeah. and throwing all the balls yeah. in the air, and yeah. you still have probably somewhat more responsibilities at home. Even coming from, um, I, I was very fortunate, and, and my child was uh, born and raised for um, the better part of uh, his life in a. In, in Sweden, where yeah. dad ended up having to um, having a really tiny baby in his hands as I went to Finnovate to win the first <laughs> Finnovate. And it was all fine. And I don't think, you know, that's special because it was Sweden, as I say, that's doable in any economy. Mm. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to talk about those challenges much because I don't think it makes a difference. And people who are um, driven to work hard and succeed and they like the challenge of multiple balls in the air, mm. they'll be fine. And people who aren't, they won't be they fine, won't but be. they won't be. That's, it's a tough road in fintech and in technology for anybody, so mm. I can't believe it's much, much easier to be a man. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that my daughter will be able to watch a video and then see there is a woman. No, but it's, I think it's, it's important that the representation, but you're right, it shouldn't just be that is the only conversation. What, what do you see? To, oh, please, sorry, please. not to interrupt you, but since we're thinking of it that way, I think one of the things that I would say is it's really important that we, we don't perpetuate it so that, you know, kind of it doesn't diminish women's idea of what they can be doing. Mm -hmm. I think things that are really important is if you if you get dropped into this um, multitasking fetish, because there's no other way to explain it, then, then one of the things to teach not only women, but men as well, if they would be doing it, is if you context switch a lot and you tire yourself mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. then just taking time for yourself, and that's the case for both okay. genders, um, making sure that you make tiny breaks into whatever you're doing so yep. that you kind of get back to who you are and what's happening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that do we need to... you take your own medicine, though? To, yeah, I do, I do. Okay. I take a lot of very incremental, tiny um, mental breaks where I think okay. of something else and so on. And um, yeah, that those are useful. They keep you, they keep you alive. Well, that, that, let's lo long may that continue. Long may that continue. <laughs> we'll see so but, far. But if, so you now are exposed to so many different businesses, so many um, people come and seek your advice. And you're obviously incredibly well read and now in the, produ in, the, in the production of your own text for people to read. What do you see as some of the future trends that we should be thinking about or that are exciting to you? In terms of technology, I can't really pinpoint anything that's really exciting because they're all equally exciting. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you're, I, I think we finally got over our, our blockchain obsession. Um, <laughs> Have I think, we? I think hopefully we have. I mm. think I think we finally got over our API lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. We're getting there. It's, yeah. it's it's not. It's far from from me. But one thing that I really think is important um, is is well, several things are 
I have an obsession with three things making this really complicated industry work, and okay. they have to be brains, courage, um, and passion. Okay. And I think just keeping um, on fostering that, whether you're a startup or you're a bank, is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, unless you have the courage, evidently you're not going to be getting anywhere. I think the passion comes when you get interested in the mm -hmm. in the industry enough. But the brains part, the knowledge part, mm -hmm. the curiosity of figuring out what things really are, mm -hmm. just looking into a box and understanding the essence of something, mm -hmm. as well as kind of the knowledge of being able to to shift through all the noise and understand curation. All those things are going to be absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. In particular in an, in an industry where, you know, who's to say the programming as is today will even exist in 20 years yeah. if AI works out yeah. well. Um, I think all you're going to be left with is the, 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 the human side of knowledge where you, you interperse knowledge with, with intuition. And, um, and if we find a way to grow that in ourselves and others, then hopefully that's the trend that's coming up. And mm -hmm. that's probably not a trend for next year or 10 years from now, but for the next 20 years, that should be the trend, going back to finding a way to, to use knowledge and humanity and make it work for, for your purposes in business. And that sinks back into your whole point around emotional banking, but in a broader, in a yeah. broader context. Um, you said your book's coming out. When's that coming out? It's a good question. When... If my publisher sees this before uh, they've gotten back on my last emails, then uh, soon. <laughs> soon. Yes, we're in the process. You'll let us know when, it, when yes, it's actually I'd love to, when yeah. we'd love to promote. Um, how do people get in contact with you? How do people find you? There's uh, an emotionalbanking.com site, um, there's a uh, duenablomstrom.com site. I'm pretty sure I'm quite visible on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, sadly, too much so sometimes. <laughs> so, any, any of those means works. Mm. Um, and just, yeah, people should absolutely come up and uh, as much as humanly possible, I'll attempt to If talk you can, to you're, you're, you're very busy <laughs> and I'm sure people are aware of that, but to, to, to read your text, I think will be really useful, but to just your blog posts alone are really insightful. They're quite cutting and, and to the point, that's <laughs> good, but they're, they're, they're really insightful. Um, you talked about little breaks. Where's your next one? Good question. I'm going to attempt to force myself into a 15 minutes latte Starbucks as soon as I get out of here. Okay, let's 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 start. <laughs> they get your name right when they put it on the side of the cup. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. So Diana. nice Thank talking you so to much. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much.